Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, watch but don't touch. Get to know the porcupine. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Drew McCarthy. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Drew. All right, well, thank you very much, Rob. And thank you everyone for joining me today for my daily dose of nature. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the North American porcupine. And this is a, an animal that is widespread in North America, but is really poorly understood and poorly researched. And it's an animal that uh, this time of year in particular, we encounter a lot uh, while out and about. Um, so we'll, I thought it'd be a good topic to, to discuss today for our daily dose. So to start out, I will just introduce myself for those that you that have never met me or have never done a natural habitat expedition with me. My name is Drew McCarthy. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Teutonia, Idaho, in the far eastern side of Idaho, right up against the border with Wyoming. Uh, I lead trips in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park for natural habitat. I also lead trips in Greenland and do some guiding in Alaska. Uh, I started guiding in 2007 uh, in, in Alaska and um, been working off and on as a guide and a teacher uh, from since that time. Uh, I grew up in Alaska. I studied geology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I also got an undergraduate in biology. Um, I ended up serving as a, as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya. I studied, or I served as an environmental education volunteer in the Rift Valley of Kenya. When I finished my time in the Peace Corps, I came back to Alaska and worked as an environmental planner for the National Park Service. Um, ended up deciding I wanted to do some teaching, so I got my master's in education. And um, But I've never been a formal classroom teacher. I've always uh, been a guide ever since I finished my master's. And uh, I think of our national parks and the outdoors as my classroom. So uh, here's a couple of photos from this last winter. I just finished my winter season leading wolf and wildlife um, safaris in, in uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton. This picture to the right was taken a couple of years ago. I'm actually holding a shrew in my hands, a small little insectivore that uh, we were setting up watching scopes or setting up, we were setting up behind scopes watching wildlife and this little shrew ran out across our feet. And it was just kind of a reminder of, of how, um, how special winter is in Yellowstone. And, um, you know, we're there to see bison, we're there to see wolves, we're there to see these large charismatic megafauna, but there's Often the smaller, less charismatic animals that end up sort of stealing the show, like in the case of this, uh, this shrew that I managed to urge into my hand and show the group and then I released. And I wanted to uh, talk about another one of those animals today uh, that we do sometimes see on our winter trips and that would be the, the North American porcupine. So one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to talk about porcupine uh, today was I've been seeing them a lot recently. So this is a couple of videos that, that my partner and I took. About three weeks ago, we were driving back from Harriman State Park, which is close to Island Park, Idaho. And we saw two porcupines up in trees uh, on the same day. And so these are a couple short videos of these animals way up near the top of uh, two different types of trees uh, that we saw while we were coming back from skiing. And so on the right, you see this porcupine uh, in a lodgepole pine. And on the left, uh, the closer up view, that individual is up in a hawthorn. And they're both doing the same thing. What these animals are doing up in these trees is they're eating the bark of the trees and they're eating the cambium, which is that layer just beneath the bark uh, that is sort of green. If you scrape it with your fingernail, you can imagine uh, that green vegetation. So here you can see this stripped bark from this porcupine up in a hawthorn tree. And um, it was just really impressive to see these, you know, two porcupines in two different spots on the same day. The one on the right we saw on the way in, ski for a couple hours, and on the way out it was still in the same tree. And this is often what will happen. And during the winter months, porcupine will spend a lot of time, sometimes in the very same tree, uh, feeding on uh, the bark of those trees as their winter diet. But I'll get more into diet in a moment. But I've been driving along now uh, all spring, keeping an eye out for porcupine, and I keep seeing uh, things up in trees that resemble porcupine. And it made me wonder if potentially that's actually an adaptive strategy that those animals, because they spend so much time in trees, they're sort of 
They do look a lot like uh, other objects that you might see up in trees this time of year. This image over to the left, this is what's called the witch's broom, which is a, an abnormal growth in the canopy of, in this case, a birch tree. Then on the right, this is a magpie nest. So for those of you that are birders, you know that this is the time of year that magpie are building their nests and they're gonna be laying their eggs and fledging their young soon. And so anyway, uh, I keep being distracted as I'm driving, noticing these, these growths up in trees, wondering if they're porcupine or wondering if they're in fact uh, a nest or a witch's broom. The other thing, other time of year uh, that you start seeing porcupine a lot is um, in the fall. And this is an image that was taken up in Alaska. This is a video of a porcupine that we encountered right along the roadside in Denali National Park. And it's a good example. It's a good way to see kind of how they move, their style of locomotion. They have kind of this lumbering sort of plodding gait. They're not particularly fast animals. Uh, they don't really need to be. Um, but you see them along roadways a lot in the spring and the fall. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one of the reasons has to do with the green up of vegetation. So because in the spring, uh, you'll get a lot more sunlight along the roadsides, uh, vegetation will start to green up and sprout on the margins of the roads. And so the porcupines will get out and start eating that fresh green vegetation. Um, but the other reason has to do with salt. And this is the reason that you see porcupine along the roadway in the fall as well. They really crave uh, salt. And uh, I'll go into some of the more specifics as to why they crave uh, salt in a moment, but uh, it's one of the reasons that those animals are attracted to roadways. And unfortunately, you do often see porcupine as roadkill on the sides of the road, and uh, they're particularly um, vulnerable to collisions because they are so slow. They are kind of hard to see, often on the margins, uh, and often they're out uh, in the evening and early morning or after dark. Uh, so you really want to watch out for a porcupine if you live in a part of North America where they're active this time of year, um, particularly uh, when you're out driving. Now, the other reason I brought, put in this piece of video from Denali is because in 2011, uh, I'm sorry, 2021, the last year I worked out in Denali for a portion of the summer, there were so many porcupine around that summer. Um, porcupine, like a lot of mammals, will go through these periods of population boom and bust. And the interval between periods of high population and periods of low population can really vary uh, for a number of reasons. But when there's a high number of porcupine, they can actually be kind of a menace. They can be kind of a pest. And so this, this image over here to the left is early morning, I walked up the hill toward one of our workshops and heard some scuffling about in the workshop and recognized that there was this, this animal that had made its way in over the night and there are any number of things in this uh, workshop that this animal could have been interested in. Uh, often uh, porcupine, because of their, their craving for salt, they're attracted to things like ax handles or to broom handles, you know, things that have been handled by people. They'll be attracted to boots because of the salts that are used to tan leather. They'll be attracted to trekking pole handles. I've, always, I've learned the lesson to be very careful about not leaving your trekking poles outside your tent when there's a lot of porcupine around because they'll, they're so attracted to the salt, they'll actually chew the handles of your, porcup of your uh, trekking poles, even backpack straps because of the perspiration that soaks into those backpack straps, you wanna be really careful about your gear. Uh, but in this particular, this particular summer in, in 2021, they were just causing the biggest menace. Um, they would be waking up, um, uh, waking up our guests and waking up our staff in the middle of the night, nine on the plywood on the bottom of their cabins, because plywood, the glues that hold plywood together, also contain a lot of salts. And so the porcupine are attracted to the salts. And this image over here to the right, I took this picture just the other day. I was out snowshoeing and the, up in the National Forest behind our house and noticed this plywood sign that had been chewed uh, by a porcupine um, over multiple seasons. You can see some of this chewing is quite old, but then if you look down here on this bottom edge, this was done just very recently. So again, porcupine are attracted to, um, uh, to anything that contains, uh, that contains natural salts. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why here in a moment. Now, in Denali, when we would have a porcupine that would come onto the property and would be damaging cabins and causing problems, we would sort of uh, urge those porcupine into a trash can. Uh, 
And you could use a broom to do that. You just lay the trash can on its side, kind of urge that porcupine into the trash can, turned upright, put it in the back of a truck, and then drive it down the road 20 miles or so and release that animal with the hope that it wouldn't return. Porcupine have pretty small ranges and they travel very slowly. They don't have um, a very large home range. So nine times out of 10, those porcupine would not come back, but occasionally, amazingly, uh, the draw of all those sweaty backpack straps and, and uh, plywood cabins would cause those porcupines to return. So I can actually see in the eye of this one, it's sort of planning, it's scheming its next, its next uh, foray into uh, destruction. So to go into a little bit more specifics about who we're going to focus on today, we'll just give some background information into the North American porcupine. Uh, the Latin uh, Arizida, Ariz Thizon dorsatum. Uh, Erythizon means angering and dorsatum means back. So it's referring to the way that those spines, the quills can be risen on their back. Other names for the porcupine, you'll hear them called uh, quill pigs commonly. Um, a juvenile porcupine is called a porky pet, which has got to be one of the best names for a juvenile in, in all of North America. Um, Porcupines are about 28 to 35 inches long, and that length includes a about a nine-inch tapered tail, which is illustrated well here in this uh, in this drawing. They can weigh from seven to 40 to 40 pounds, so they're actually quite large animals. Uh, and in in Alaska, a porcupine tends to be almost twice as big on average as a porcupine here in the lower 48 or in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem where I do my, most of my work. And I'll talk a little bit about why porcupines tend to be a little bigger in colder climates than they are here uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which relatively speaking is warmer than Alaska. Coloration, they come across as mostly black, but they have these very yellowish gold tips to their hairs. Uh, and then of course the, the thorns themselves are yellowish with a black tip, giving them kind of a yellowish coloration uh, from the back end. Um, these quills are very easily detached and they're barbed. So the barbs on the quills, I'll talk more about this as the presentation progresses, but the barbs on the quills are one of the unique things to uh, the North American porcupine and New World porcupines in particular. So when we talk about porcupines worldwide, we can divide them into Old World and New World porcupines. And so really there's two types of, of uh, New World porcupines. One of them is this animal, the North American porcupine. And then the other uh, is this animal here, the, the Brazilian porcupine. So these animals are also a New World porcupine. Uh, their Latin is a Conendu prehensilis. And uh, they're also, there's just another name for them is the prehensile-tailed porcupine. And you can see in this image uh, how impressive the tail is on that porcupine. Unlike the North American porcupine, it's, it's much longer and it has the ability to articulate. It doesn't have any thorns at the very tip of its tail, which allows it to use that tail to help it move through the forest canopy. These animals uh, range throughout Brazil, but also in Central America. You can find uh, this particular porcupine. Uh, they're a little bit smaller. They're 22 to 30, 34 inches in length, and that includes about a 10 to 20 inch long tail, and they weigh between 4 and 11 pounds, so they're not nearly as big as the North American porcupine. Uh, as, as I already pointed out, they have this um, incredible prehensile tail, but they also have this sort of bulbous nose uh, that's hairless, makes them pretty distinctive. And then along their back, they can get these four inch, you know, tricolor thorns uh, that are also used for protection and, and are also barbed like the North American uh, porcupine. And these animals spend most of their life in the trees. So they spend about 85% of their life in the trees. Unlike the North American porcupine, which is about 50-50 uh, time in the trees and time on the ground. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, old world porcupines <clears throat> that are around the world. So the largest porcupine uh, and really the third largest rod rodent in the world would be the crested porcupine. Uh, in this close relative, the South African porcupine, you can see they range all throughout the continent of Africa. Uh, with the South African porcupine being south of the equator, the crested porcupine being north of the equator. Uh, 
the Swahili name for this porcupine is Ungu Ungu. Uh, and that was, uh, I learned to speak a bit of Swahili while I was in Kenya, so I thought it was fun to report the Swahili name for this animal. These animals are a lot bigger than our, our New World porcupines. So they can be 30 to 47 inches long, including a seven inch tapered tail. They can weigh up to 60 pounds. So anywhere from 26 to 60 pounds. The only rodents in the world that are larger than the South African porcupine is the capybara. Uh, and then uh, the beaver um, can get bigger than, uh, than one of these South African porcupines. Uh, they're very large. They have black bodies. Um, probably the most distinguishing characteristic between the South African porcupine and the crested porcupine is this little patch here on the, their backs. Um, the South African porcupine has a black rump, uh, and the uh, the crested porcupine does not have that black patch there. Um, they have a crest of elongated hairs, spiny hairs across the forehead and shoulders. You can see those uh, spines there. And they can raise these up to enlar enlarge their body size. They can look up to three times larger when they erect those hairs and those uh, spines, uh, which can make them look sort of intimidating uh, to, to pre potential predators. Another African porcupine I want to uh, just highlight here quickly, another old world porcupine, would be the brush-tailed porcupine. And the Swahili name for this animal was Njiko, or is Njiko. They're also smaller, 21 to 33 inches in length, uh, including a five to 10 inch tapered tail. They weigh three to eight pounds. So these animals are quite a bit smaller than their South African and crested porcupine um, compatriots. Uh, they're kind of a long bodied, low slung animal, um, a little not quite as upright as, as the other African porcupine. Uh, they have hollow white rattle quills at the tips of their tails. They can actually rattle those quills uh, in order to um, indicate stress and as a as a signal to a potential predator that hey you don't you don't want to mess with this with this animal. Um, so the other thing that's interesting about their tails is that their tails the tip will actually easily detach, um, and then it doesn't grow back. So it's sort of a defense uh, to a potential attack, but it's a one-time deal. It's only useful to that animal. Um, uh, once in its life. So those are some of the old world porcupines, but uh, why am I talking about these animals? You know, my subject today is the North American porcupine. Well, I want to talk a little bit about a subject in biology called convergent evolution. And a presentation I did a couple weeks ago, uh, earlier this month, was on the pronghorn antelope, or the pronghorn, North American pronghorn. And I talked about how this animal looks very different from its distant relative, the giraffe and the okapi. They were separated as the continents drifted, and these animals took on very different forms, uh, but, are, but are distant relatives. Uh, in the case of the porcupines, these animals, uh, these rodents, uh, very distant groups actually evolved sort of to have similar characteristics. They're all rodents, but they're very distantly related rodents, but they evolved to have similar characteristics through that same process of convergent evolution. So some of the similarities that we can highlight between a new world porcupine, like our North American porcupine, and an old world individual, like this crested porcupine, some of the similarities, they all have these sharp defensive quills. And those quills can be, can be erected. They can be risen up to make the animal look bigger, to make the animal look more, um, more foreboding. Uh, these, whether it be the, the new world or the old world porcupine, all their quills are basically modified hairs and they're hollow. They're hollow modified hairs. Um, both the new world and the old world porcupine have are very slow moving and have large claws that are used for digging uh, and for climbing. Although old, old world porcupines are primarily uh, animals uh, that stay on the ground. So to talk about some of their differences um, between new world porcupines and old world, uh, again, this sort of the old, the New World porcupines tend to be arboreal, uh, so they're tree, dwell, tree dwelling for a good portion or for some portion of their life. Uh, old World, they're ground dwelling. You don't really see them up in the trees. They're using their claws more for digging than they are for climbing. Uh, New World porcupines are solitary, uh, nearly always solitary, with the exception of the breeding season. Old World porcupines live in small groups, sometimes up to 20 individuals living together. 
Uh, New World porcupines are cathemeral, which basically means they can be active during the day or the night, uh, any time of the day, although typically the North American porcupine is most active kind of in the crepuscular hours, so dawn and dusk. Um, World War porcupines are almost exclusively nocturnal. New World porcupines, they have barbed quills um, with, with bristles, uh, meaning that the quills have little um, barbs which uh, are almost like microscopic hooks, like a fish hook has a barb, which um, when that quill enters into a, another animal, those quills, uh, those barbs help to hold that quill in place. Also, the quills grow amongst a lot of other coarse hairs or bristles and fur. With the old world porcupines, they have non-barbed quills, uh, and the quills grow in clusters separate from the hair, the hair covered portion of the animal. So there's some of the important differences between uh, new world and old world porcupines. So to talk about the arboreal life style of our North American porcupine uh, and the South American Brazilian uh, prehensile tail porcupine, um, you know, primarily they're up in trees for a couple of reasons. One is for food. So um, they're eating, in the case of the North American porcupine, they eat a lot of uh, bark and they do eat needles uh, off of uh, conifer trees. Um, the old world, the new world porcupines in South America, they're gonna be eating fruit as well as leaves and bark. So they're climbing up in the trees primarily to find their food sources. Um, but they're also up there for camouflage and to act and to, for predator avoidance. So um, when, a, when one, either of these animals are pursued, they'll climb up into the trees um, as a way to avoid predation um, uh, these animals have to, um, as they're climbing, there's a lot of abrasion to their underside. So particularly with the North American porcupine, they actually have, uh, their sensitive organs are, are enclosed in a flap to protect those organs while they're climbing. So uh, their genitalia are not exposed until, they're, until reproduction. And when they climb, uh, that those organs are protected uh, as they're climbing. And I actually have a video here of a, of a baby porcupine climbing here in North America. And there's a couple things I wanna point out in this. Um, first of all, if you watch closely the use of its tail, the porcupines, the, per, the, the primary purpose of the tail is for defense. You know, it's covered in quills and they can swing that tail, but they'll also use that tail almost like a woodpecker uses its tail to brace against the tree. If you watch really carefully, you can see this animal, it's kind of bracing that tail against the tree to give purchase, allowing its limbs, its forelimbs and its high limbs, hind limbs to slowly um, make its way up the tree. So they're really pretty good climbers. That's not to say that they don't occasionally fall. So porcupines do occasionally fall, primarily the North American variety. And so it's not uncommon to find, to see porcupine with injuries, broken bones uh, as a result of falling. Also, they can sometimes quill themselves. So when, when an animal does fall out of a tree, uh, those quills that are their primary purpose is, to, is for defense can actually embed in their own bodies. And there's some special adaptations to prevent injury as a result of that that I'll talk about in a moment. So good climbers, but not, but you know, like all climbers, they do occasionally take a fall. So I want to have a, a closer look at, at the feet of the North American porcupine. Um, their feet actually look, their tracks look almost like miniature bear tracks. In fact, when you see them in the silt and in the mud along rivers in Alaska, I've often been puzzled, uh, is that a bear cub or is that a porcupine? Um, they have long claws, which as was shown in that last video, those claws are used for uh, getting purchase on the bark and helping them climb. They also have very textured pads, which uh, act as grip to help them make their way um, up, up the trees. Um, you know, they don't travel long distances on the ground. Um, they have a home range of about 300 uh, uh, acres, which is not, not a lot of space for an, uh, for an animal throughout the year. And they're going to be using that home range throughout the year to, to find food. So I wanna transition uh, and talk a little bit about the diet of uh, the porcupine throughout the year. So let's start with now. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been seeing a lot of them uh, up in trees, uh, feeding on the cambium, the bark of, of 
um, pine trees mostly, but they'll also eat the bark of other deciduous trees like aspen. They'll eat the bark of hawthorn, as I mentioned. Um, but as the spring progresses, and this spring has, is progressing very slow. This is a, it was about 11 degrees this morning at my house, and um, and there, we have so much snow that it's barely up to the bottoms of the windows. So we're having a very cold spring. But as spring warms up, porcupine will transition their diet away from the cambium of trees, and they'll begin eating uh, the buds, the sort of emerging buds and catkins of a lot of deciduous trees. In fact, this picture shows these very fresh little buds that are beginning to grow on this particular shrub. And porcupines will spend a lot of time focusing on uh, eating uh, that vegetative material, aspen, birch, and willow in particular. Um, but shortly after these uh, plants fully leaf out, their leaves begin to contain a lot of tannins, which are highly toxic to a lot of animals, including porcupine. So at that point, they, they stop eating uh, the buds and they stop eating the leaves. Um, we'll talk about their summer diet here in a second. But as I mentioned before, during the spring, this is this period of year when porcupine are particularly attracted to salt. Uh, their craving for salt is super intense this time of year. And the reason has to do with this totally vegetarian diet. So in their wintertime diet is basically just bark uh, and just cambium. Um, and suddenly in the spring, they've got a much broader range of vegetative material to eat. So they're suddenly eating a lot more material. Leaves contain high levels of potassium uh, versus sodium. And animals like a porcupine, uh, they have a much higher requirement for sodium due to that, their excitable tissues. So you and I, you know, we have nerves and muscles uh, that require sodium for activation. So it's this proportion of potassium versus sodium that causes them to crave sodium as they start becoming a little more active in the spring. Um, also among the females, they're pregnant or soon they'll be having their porcupets, their juveniles. And the pregnancy hormones cause a craving for sodium because they're gonna start lactating soon uh, and that incurs a lot of sodium loss. So it's one of the reasons why porcupines are so crazy about salt uh, this time of year. So transitioning into summer, porcupines during the summer months, uh, they're not as much in the trees as much. They might go up in the trees for defense if they're scared, if they're frightened. But in the summer, they transition to eating, um, to ground, ground feeding mainly. So they'll eat a lot of grasses, they'll eat clover, They'll eat a lot of herbaceous plants. Um, I've even heard of them eating, uh, they supposedly really love uh, the, the leaves of raspberry bushes. So you'll see them around raspberry bushes in parts of the east that have raspberry plants. Um, so they're gonna be less feeding in the, in the trees. Uh, and then in the fall, they're gonna start making their way back up into the trees. At that point, they do actually eat aspen leaves. Uh, at that point, the leaves have less tannins and so they're less toxic and the porcupines will return to the trees in the fall. Now in the winter is when things really get kind of interesting for these animals. In the winter is when uh, these animals use a combination of um, physiological and behavioral adaptations to, to survive the very long winters in, in North America. So, uh, you know, porcupines, they have very little activity in the winter. Uh, you can see them up in literally the same trees for, for weeks on end, um, but, but they don't hibernate, which is really incredible. These animals are as active in the middle of winter, at least metabolically active in the middle of winter as they would be in the summer. And they don't have any protective lodges like a beaver. So they're, they spend a lot of time up in the trees and they're very exposed to the elements. And uh, really pretty impressive that these animals um, don't have sort of a, hibernation on the hoof, don't have sort of a temporary hibernation. Uh, if it's 30 degrees above or 30 degrees uh, below Fahrenheit, uh, these animals will have the same body temperature. Incidentally, their body temperature is very similar to you and I. Um, uh, our body temperature is very similar to a porcupine. Uh, their quills are insulative. So because they're hollow, their quills and that dense fur does provide quite a lot of insulation. But the biggest insulating factor for porcupines is their fat they have an extremely thick layer of fat. So throughout the summer, into the fall, these animals, their body mass is nearly 50% fat. So they have really put on a lot of weight during the summer months. Um, so they're gonna be living off that fat during the winter, but in terms of what they're eating, 
uh, they're mostly eating, uh, as I've said before now, the cambium of the bark of these trees that they spend uh, so much time in in the winter. Uh, but again, it's it's a pretty highly toxic. Um, there's a lot of toxins in the in the bark and in the cambium as well. So uh, they eat a lot of it, uh, but it takes a lot of energy to process. Um, during the winter, they in the Jeep Yellowstone ecosystem, they prefer pine trees. Uh, but in Alaska, porcupines spend their winters in mixed forests. So they spend half their time in white spruce trees and half their time in birch trees, uh, eating the bark off those off those those plants. Um, you know, the cambium that they're eating uh, has very little protein, about 0.5% protein, and so it makes it very difficult for porcupines to maintain weight during the the winter. Uh, so one of the ways that they uh, despite eating the slow protein food, one of the ways that they uh, don't lose too much lean tissue mass uh, is, you know, they're living off those fat reserves. So they're going to use about 30% of those fat reserves throughout the course of a typical winter. But they also have an organ called a cecum. And this is kind of the anatomical um, resilience that I mentioned uh, to these long winters. So the cecum is a little bit like a rumen. Uh, it's a post-gut fermenta fermentation vat. So, you know, we have our appendix in our large intestine. The cecum is, is very similar to the appendix, but it's much larger in an animal like a porcupine. The cecum gets packed with low quality um, woody material that those animals are eating throughout the winter. And in the cecum, there's bacteria. And those bacteria break down the cellulose, they break down the woody material. They produce volatile fatty acids that that animal uses then to help, um, to help survive the winter. Um, and for for energy metabolism um, so they also urinate a lot during the winter and part of the purpose for urinating a lot is that they're it's one way of ridding their bodies of all the toxins that are building up from the the low quality food that they're eating during the winter so they're constantly flushing those toxins out of their system by by frequently uh, urinating so to go into a little bit of, of detail about uh, kind of what are the impacts of of porcupine feeding, you'll often see trees that appear to be stripped of their bark, and you'll notice that the, the bark is stripped near the top of the tree as opposed to near the base. Um, if you see tree uh, bark that's stripped near the base, it could have been a snowshoe hare that did that, um, but often it's porcupine. Uh, sometimes moose can also chew uh, the bark of trees lower down, but this um, it's girdling of of uh, bark high up in the in the canopy is very characteristic of porcupine um, feeding, and um, it can actually be a little bit of a frustration for foresters uh, because as a porcupine will feed, they'll sort of nip the buds um, and on sort of the apical buds at the top of the tree, and that will cause the tree to continue to grow. It won't kill the tree, but it'll cause it to grow up normally. And those wood tissues that are sort of bent and unusual are not as useful for forestry as a straight shaft. And so porcupines can be quite irritating to foresters. They can kill the tree altogether if they completely um, encircle the, eat all the bark off the base of the tree. Uh, that'll effectively make that, um, that tree die, um, which again, to a forester is a little bit of a frustration. Now they're using their incisors to clear away that bark. And so I wanna talk a little bit about rodent incisors and porcupine teeth in general in specific, which is just really pretty fascinating. So um, the incisors are actually a long arc. You can see here in this image, the incisor is, 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 is embedded in the skull in a long arc, and it's continually growing um, throughout the life of the animal. And at the base of the tooth here, the tooth is continually, new materials continually being added at the base of the tooth as at the tip of the tooth is continually wearing. Now, in the case of a porcupine, throughout a typical year, they're going to use this 100% of the length of the tooth uh, it will be worn away over the course of the year. So now, of course, that tooth is continually regenerating, but that's how fast that's how fast the, the wear is occurring among porcupines. Uh, this yellow coloration that you can see is is the product of iron oxides that are impregnated into the growing tooth to help strengthen the leading edge. So there's two factors strengthening the leading edge of these incisors, both the upper and the lower. There's the iron oxides, but then also the enamel is a lot thicker 
uh, on the outer portion of the, the tooth. And that allows the chiseled character to be maintained as the tooth wears. So the, the outer portion, which is more resistant to wear, um, is going to maintain as the inner portion is going to wear more quickly, maintaining that, that chiseled edge. So this type of tooth is what we call a, a rootless tooth. It's not fully formed. Uh, it's going to be continually growing uh, out the along the course of the animal's life. Now the molars are different. So some rodents have rootless molars, or molars that continually grow throughout the course of the life, uh, the animal's life. But porcupine, they actually have uh, molars that are more similar to our molars. So they're going to be replaced twice over the course of the animal's or only replaced once over the course of the animal's life. They do have very thick enamel, which is important because you know after the porcupine uh, harvests the bark or the leaf that it's about to eat or the needle, it's gonna need to thoroughly grind up that material with its molars. Um, and the molars wear very slowly, they're very, very thick enamel. Um, you know, in a normal natural setting, uh, many porcupine would actually be killed by a predator prior to their teeth wearing uh, wearing so slowly. But in the absence of the primary predator for porcupine in North America, uh, many porcupines are actually living to quite old age. So 10 to 12 years um, they can grow and they can live. And so these teeth eventually start to wear out. The enamel completely wears down. Uh, the animals start to suffer from tooth decay. They can't eat as much. Uh, and so a lot of them will just die of old age or they'll die from parasites as opposed to being killed by predators. Um, so I do want to segue into talking a little bit about more about porcupine predators. And the primary predator for a porcupine in North America, and particularly the lower 48 states, would be the, the fisher. Now, a lot of people haven't ever heard of a fisher. Fishers are pretty incredible animals. They're weasels, they're members of the weasel family. Fishers are um, pretty closely related to wolverines. They're also related to pine marten or the American marten. Um, but they are the primary predator of uh, porcupine. They're the only predator that will kill porcupine by preference, meaning that that's their preferred food source. There are other predators of the porcupine. So bobcat, cougars, uh, wolves, coyote will kill porcupine. Even great gray owls can kill a porcupine. In Alaska, the lynx will kill a porcupine. But in the in more southern latitudes, uh, the fisher is the primary uh, predator. It should be noted that a porcupine outweighs a fisher by two to one. So it's impressive that these animals can not only deal with the spines and the quills, but also kill an animal that's nearly twice their size. The length of a fisher, about 20 to 25 inches, they're very long and thin. They have very short legs. Um, and like all weasels, they're pretty specialized in killing rodents. So weasels around the world uh, have specialized in killing their own sort of rodent. They have a rodent specialty. Um, but the, this particular weasel, the fisher, uh, it's evolved to specialize in killing uh, porcupines. And there's stories of how fishers would go about doing this. Um, some of the stories say that they would flip a porcupine over and get to its soft underbelly that doesn't have any spines or quills. There's stories that say that fishers would come up through the snow and grab porcupine from below, but all that is conjecture. Uh, the way that fishers kill porcupine is basically through, through patience. So they'll strike the face of the porcupine, both with their claw and with their teeth, and they'll do this continually. It can take 30, 40 minutes for them to continually bite the face of a porcupine, finally wear it out to the point that, uh, the, that the fisher can, can kill it. Um, now, it's not to say that they don't get quilled. If you were to look at a fisher, uh, they have shrapnel throughout their body from a lifetime of killing porcupines. Bits of quill uh, are found uh, in, their, in their tissues and their organs. Uh, they can eat the quills. If you look at um, droppings of a fisher, you can see quills in the droppings. They have pretty amazing stomachs that can actually cause the quills to soften and not fully digest, but soften the quills enough that it won't damage their, their digestion. Um, really, the only animals that threaten fishers are us, our people. So to talk a little bit about the story, 
of how porcupine or how fishers came to disappear from much of North America. Um, by 1940, they were basically hunted out of the lower 48 states, and, and they were particularly prized by trappers. So because they have a pelt that is very similar to a Siberian sable, uh, they were highly prized by North American trappers. Um, so in uh, North America now, in certain uh, national parks and in national forests, fisheries are actually being reintroduced to help deal with overpopulations of porcupine and the impacts that, the, that porcupines are having on, uh, on trees and forestry. Um, I've actually seen a fisher, I was driving once between Big Sky, Montana, uh, down through the very northwest corner uh, of Yellowstone, heading down toward West Yellowstone, and a, a, a very dark uh, weasel ran across the road in front of my car. It was not a wolverine, it would be not the habitat for a wolverine, and it was way too big to be a pine marten. Um, so there are fish around uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but uh, but they're pretty rare. But in different parts of lower 48, they are being re re released, um, as as shown here in this in this image from I think this is from Olympic National Park. So um, whether it be a uh, a bobcat, a cougar, um, a fisher, uh, when a porcupine gets killed, you know the animal be, will be consumed from that. Uh, that ventral side, and you'll often see just the just the quills, just the um, the pelt remaining. Um, so I have a really great piece of video that will show you how um, a coyote, at least, is going to attempt to to kill this porcupine. I'll go ahead and start this video. Now watch the way the porcupine uses its tail. It's continually turning its back to that coyote. The coyote looks a little confused and somewhat baffled, but persistent. But you can see that animal, the porcupine's actually pretty fast. It's able to whip that tail around. It's able to keep that, that dorsal side of its body to, uh, to the coyote to prevent the coyote from being able to get to its face or to its underbelly, which is again, uh, a quillus. So to talk a little bit more about the quills of the North American porcupine. Um, 30,000 quills cover a typical North American porcupine. Uh, they're hollow and they're loosely attached right at the base. You can see this very this, this spot where the thicker hollow quill narrows into a little uh, a smaller bit of the quill. They're very easily detached. So um, there's this sort of wise tale that porcupines can shoot their quills or can throw their quills. They can't. But they can, because the quills are so easily detached, when an animal does swing its tail uh, rapidly, uh, those quills will easily uh, become dislodged and, and lodge into the flesh of a potential predator. Um, now, these, these quills are barbed the entire length of the shaft, and my next slide will show those barbs. You can't see it in this, they're microscopic. Um, but I wanted to mention that uh, those quills, the barbs on the quills actually help to draw that quill into the flesh of the animal that is unfortunate to, enough to be to be quilled. I've actually heard stories of people, uh, a researcher once had a quill go into his bicep. The quill, as, as the movement of the muscles contracted, drew the quill into the tissues. I know this is just one of those things like, Oof, it's horrible to think about, but the quill was drawn into the, the muscle, traveled through his arm, and then came out below his elbow uh, days later. And it's kind of impressive to think that, wouldn't that cause an infection? Wouldn't that cause a horrible infection? Well, it turns out that porcupine quills are covered in a grease that has uh, an antibiotic uh, property to it. It's a fatty acid, it's called palmitic acid. And that acid acts on gram-positive bacteria and causes them to die. So this almost as if these quills are treated with an antibiotic. Now, why? Why would it benefit a porcupine to have antibiotic quills. I thought the point of the quills was to, to deter a potential predator. Well, what happens is, I mentioned earlier that porcupine are not actually the best climbers and they do occasionally fall. Well, they'll get quills embedded into their own tissues and that way the quill can pass through their own tissues without causing infection. At least that's the thought as to why um, that, that property um, is there. Uh, this image shows uh, a sort of a microscopic 
electron micrograph of the tip of a porcupine quill. I should mention that these tiny little fish scale like barbs go the entire length of the quill. Um, and I also have the stick to the right, which gives you an indication of how the quills are interspersed with fur and barbs. Uh, again, this is different than old world porcupines where the quills are in sort of clusters or bunches totally independent of, of the fur. Um, hang on one second here. I wanted to mention one last thing about the quills and that is that they're hollow. I've mentioned that before, but the hollow nature of the quills actually allows them to be somewhat buoyant. Believe it or not, porcupine can swim quite well and the buoyancy of those quills helps to uh, keep them upright as they're traveling across water bodies. Um, and uh, it's that hollow quill that uh, allows better flotation. Now, uh, if you're unlucky enough to have a, a dog that uh, has been in contact with a porcupine, you can find yourself in a pretty unfortunate situation. And because of the hollow nature of those quills, there's two things you can do to get those quills out. You know, if your dog is patient enough and is calm enough, uh, you can pull them out with pliers. But if you clip the quill first, it helps deflate it a little bit. And that makes it, the quill, the barbs, a little less uh, apt to catch and it's easier to, to remove the quills. But if a dog is really badly um, in, a, in a bad altercation with the porcupine, the best thing to do is to take it to a vet. The vet can um, uh, anesthetize, you know, can uh, tranquilize the animal and it's more easy and safer to remove those, those quills. Um, so porcupine, they have other uh, defenses beyond the quills. Uh, so the quills are actually quite a visual deterrent. So you can see in this image, when a porcupine kind of erects its quills, the fur on the back of its, um, on its back, uh, it, they're black and white and they're, they're pretty strong visual deterrent. So a lot of predators uh, imagine an owl that might be thinking of swooping down and grabbing a, a porcupine in the low light of evening would see that black and white coloration and might think better of doing that. Also, the quills act a little bit as a rattle. They make a little bit of a sound um, as the animal moves. Also, a porcupine will chatter their teeth. First, their incisors, but secondarily, their molars as a sign that, hey, they're stressed, stay back. Um, lastly, they actually have a pretty powerful odor. So um, not, not as strong as a skunk, uh, but if you end up smelling a porcupine in an enclosed space, um, it almost makes your eyes burn, it makes your nose run. Uh, they have a pretty strong uh, and unpleasant um, odor. So I want to talk a little bit about porcupine reproduction. So I already mentioned that uh, a porcupine is called a, a juvenile is called a porcupet. And there's no denying that they are ridiculously cute animals uh, as this picture uh, depicts. Uh, breeding season for porcupine is September through November. And several males will be attracted to an individual female and a female will climb up into a tree and she'll actually urinate on the branches of the tree. And that creates kind of this, this sort of cloud of odor that draws the males into the base of the tree to seek out that female who is sexually receptive. If there's more than one male, they will compete with each other. The males will chase each other through the trees, um, but generally um, the larger of the two porcupine males is the, is the one that, um, that prevails. Um, now, there's a couple unusual things, kind of strangely unique to porcupine uh, courtship. One is, uh, as the male uh, gets close to the female that he's looking to mate with, he'll actually urinate on her. So he'll spray urine on the female. Uh, if she's not into it, she'll move away. Um, but if she is, uh, if she's, you know, sexually receptive, she'll stay put. And um, Sometimes uh, one of the things that females will do is they'll do a little bit of a courtship dance to show that they're that they're sexually receptive. So they'll kind of, um, I have a video that will show you in here in a second, but they'll do a little bit of a courtship dance. The male will sometimes join in. Um, it's pretty strange, um, but a male has to really wait that there's the, about an eight to 12 um, hour period of heat for a female um, because he's not gonna be able to advance further until she's 100% ready. But when she is 100% ready for 
for copulation, she'll lift up that barbed tail and she'll put it up against her back. And, and surprisingly, from there, it's a pretty typical uh, undertaking um, as long as she pulls that tail up and uh, exposes her underside. Um, so I want to mention that they have a very, very long gestation period for a, a rodent. Uh, they have a gestation that's about 210 days. And then sometime between April and June, uh, the female will give birth. They have small litters. It's usually just one porcupet, but sometimes two. Um, and then you have to, you know, these animals, they're, they're born precocial, meaning that their, their eyes are open, they can hear. They actually have quills. The quills are fully formed, but they don't harden until about 30 minutes after birth. So they go through the birth canal, they're very soft, but then once they're exposed to air, um, they harden up and can protect that porcupet. This is that, um, what's sometimes called the exercise dance or sort of a courtship dance. This is at a zoo, but it gives you a sense of what, uh, of that kind of uh, courtship dance. And apparently the male and the female will sort of join in together uh, in captivity, uh, breeders and zookeepers call this the exercise dance, and you can see why, because it does sort of resemble um, aerobics, step aerobics or something. So I want to get close to finishing up here. I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the ecological roles of porcupine? Why are they important uh, in the ecology of North America? They're very similar to beaver. They often get referred to as, as um, ecosystem engineers. So not quite to the same degree as beaver, but they create a lot of dead wood that creates habitat for other animals. So because porcupine do often kill trees, those trees fall, all that dead wood uh, ends up being a, ho a home for other animals. In addition, when they're up in the canopy, they clear out the canopy of the trees that they're feeding off of. That clearing of the canopy allows better habitat for birds, and for other arboreal animals. Um, and then they're, they're an important primary consumer. So they're eating a lot of vegetative material. So they end up being a, a, pre, a prey species for, for certain predators uh, out on the landscape. Um, finishing up here, some of the cultural uses for porcupine, both the Alaska native and uh, American native groups uh, use the the quills for artwork, so they can dye the quills, they can make earrings out of the quills, um, they can be, uh, clothing can be made, or decoration for clothing can be made for quills. Um, a lot of people, a lot of native groups would use the porcupine as a food source, uh, but only during periods of duress. So, you know, there's this, this, this idea that you never want to kill a porcupine unless you absolutely need it, because it's a relatively easy food source to get, you know, uh, you don't need much in the way of they, they aren't very fast you can you can get to them and, and kill them pretty easily um, but uh, it's not a food source you want to use unless you're absolutely desperate I respect that animal and it will uh, potentially save you when you when you might need it um, and then there's some there's some spiritual value and there's some um, you know a lot of some several of the interior Alaska native groups um, because porcupines give birth so easily uh, they, uh, native women uh, would eat the meat of porcupine or they would wear the bones around their waist uh, in hopes of having a, an easy childbirth for themselves. So there's some cultural importance to porcupine among the Khoikhan people of, of interior Alaska. So we had about five minutes here till the end of the hour. So I wanted to give it back to Rob uh, and take any questions that, uh, that you, some of you may have come up with. This is, this porcupine here is on my porch in Alaska at the cabin where I stayed uh, that summer of 2021. All right, thank you, Drew. Now, before we begin with the question and answers, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So, do porcupines have the same quills all their lives and do they grow back? And how quickly do they grow back if they do? So they do grow back. Um, they don't have the same quills their whole life. So it's a little bit like any other hair or integument. It's gonna be constantly uh, recycling. Um, the porcupine, uh, you know, one of the ways that native people will collect quills to make artwork is they'll use a piece of styrofoam and they'll sort of tap the animal on its tail and they'll take those quills and then they'll, they don't kill the animal, but they'll use the quills for artwork. 
and um, they won't. It does take some time for those quills to grow back. Uh, so I don't know how long it takes them to grow back, but they do eventually uh, grow back. Do you know how often uh, the the quills would kill a predator? So the the two ways that they'll quill, kill predators would be one if the quill made its way through into an important organ, uh, but more commonly it they get so embedded in the face of the predator, say a mountain lion, that it causes an infection. It causes that animal to not be able to feed, and and then they starve. So uh, they're not dying necessarily of the infection, but they're dying of starvation. Um, I've seen you know one mountain lion with quills in its face uh, in Yellowstone, uh, but I don't know how often uh, a prey species ends up falling, you know, dying as a result of being quilled. Do you know if the uh, porcupine in the video with the coyote lived to tell the tale? <laughs> I don't know. That that piece of imagery was from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and um, it didn't uh, it didn't give any any follow up uh, information or notes. But it's a great video. It really shows how the porcupines use that tail for defense. So. Are porcupines, uh, do they travel in large groupings ever? Is that common for them? Well, they're very solitary. Yeah, they're solitary animals, uh, with the exception of when it comes time to breed, uh, then you'll see groups together. Very occasionally in the winter, I've heard stories of a porcupine sharing a den, just two, uh, because it's hard to find good spots for porcupines to overwinter. And they don't spend much time in the den. It's not like a beaver that's in a lodge. Um, but they're they're generally solitary animals. Are they afraid of people? You know, they're they're not because they have such an effective defense. They don't they don't tend to avoid people, as this picture you know demonstrates. This animal was on my porch. It had been chewing you know the plywood underneath the cabin. And I basically had to walk away and came back later in the day and the porcupine was gone, but they have such an effective defense that um, they'll sometimes climb trees if they have a tree available uh, as a result to get, of people getting too close. Um, but they're pretty well defended and they don't tend to, to uh, avoid people as much as they probably should. So at what age do the porcupines actually leave their mother and go out on their own? So they grow quite quickly. They're with their mother for just that first first summer. You know, I have, there's an, another another video on the Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, Wildlife Notebook series that actually shows them them nursing. Um, but they they're not with them for much more than just the the several months of the summer uh, until they can um, be big enough to head off on their own. Does the male stay with the female, or does it move on? It moves on. So after breeding, uh, there's there's no assistance. They're not very good dads. They just they move on. So how is it that they produce so much body fat eating a vegetarian diet? Well, a lot of it has to do with the uh, you know the, the vegetation in the summer is is abundant. So they're eating a lot of it, and they're eating constantly day and night. Um, the physiology, the complete physiology, I don't fully understand, but you know, think about a moose. Moose is the same way. They're able to convert the um, the low quality, you know, pr primarily cellulose material into you know a full size moose with six inches of fat. Um, and it does have to do a little bit in the case of a moose with the rumen, and I imagine that the cecum in a porcupine also helps to to convert the byproducts of that digestion into into protein but then also into fat so since they do urinate a lot do they require a lot of water you know they like a lot of animals in the winter they're getting most of the moisture that they need uh, from the vegetation that they're eating which is really amazing to think about but there's enough moisture my understanding is there's enough moisture in the cambion uh, that they're not having to to eat consume snow for instance to supplement they get enough moisture from from their diet so is it fair to say that our vegetable gardens could be in danger from attack from these porcupines <laughs>
I think, you know, it's deer are going to cause a lot more uh, negative impacts to gardeners and moose in Alaska than porcupines. The biggest, you know, annoyance that porcupine really causes is that is that insistent, that never ending quest for salt. So chewing ax handles and plywood, that's more of a menace than uh, a porcupine going for a, a garden. Can salt licks be used to minimize porcupine damage or, and do they harm porcupines at all? You know, and I've never, in the research that I did and in, in the time that I lived in Alaska, I never really came across any references to using salt licks, um, but they really do spend a lot of time on, on roadsides, you know, in areas where the roads are salted. Um, I've even heard stories of seeing porcupine eating mud on the side of the road that likely was impregnated with salt, but I've never heard of uh, salt licks being used. Well, thanks for addressing that, but unfortunately that's going to be the last question that we do have time for. So I'm gonna throw it back to you for some closing comments. Yeah, well, I just wanted to again, thank you all for joining me today for this Daily Dose. Um, you know, rodents are one of the most widely distributed and successful uh, groups of mammals on earth. And it's fascinating to me to, to spend some time with you today talking a little bit about how, you know, convergent evolution has taken two really distant, disparate groups of rodents and, and caused them to have such similar and effective means of defense and uh, I hope you all enjoyed my my presentation. Drew, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NADHAB, give us a call at the number on your screen or send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.